Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. David Van Drunen. I do appreciate uh, the invitation, and uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, I, was, uh, I was asked, at least the invitation as I understood it, was uh, to speak on anything I wanted to on the relation of law and theology. Uh, so I did think about, I, I noticed that the, the title was regarding natural law. I did think about a lecture simply on natural law, which I've done a lot of uh, work on. Uh, but I decided that it might be uh, better or more fun uh, to do uh, a more general topic, a, a uh, reformed theology of law. And obviously I can't be comprehensive uh, in the time we have, but I hope to be uh, relatively thorough. Now, uh, the, the way that I think about doing theology, and I assume that uh, many of you here uh, would uh, think of it in similar ways, is that I want to be thoroughly biblical uh, in my uh, theology, that theology is, uh, at the heart of it is the exposition of uh, the Word of God. Uh, and yet, as a Reformed theologian, uh, I want to practice theology uh, in, uh, in my tradition, in the Reformed tradition, learning from those who have gone before uh, and uh, seeking to uh, incorporate uh, all that they have learned uh, and expressed. And even before that, that the Ref Reformed Christianity is uh, not uh, something other than uh, part of the one holy Catholic apostolic uh, church, and so that uh, our theology should reflect uh, the broader theology uh, of Christian history. So with that in view, uh, I would like to talk about Reformed theology by using uh, a template uh, that uh, has, was in use uh, in medieval theology. Uh, you can find it in Thomas Aquinas, uh, for example. Uh, this is a template that many uh, Reformed theologians have used. Uh, a couple of prominent examples, uh, Jerome Zanke and uh, Franciscus Junius, uh, two very important uh, 16th century Reformed theologians, uh, also use this template. So uh, I would like uh, to use it and to uh, the way I want to explain it and defend it uh, reflects the way that Reformed people uh, have, uh, have done so, and yet I'm not just reading somebody else's notes. I'm, I'm presenting it in my own way uh, and uh, trying to incorporate some of my own uh, thoughts and uh, insights as well. Uh, as every generation, of course, we try to keep learning and try to keep uh, refining the deposit of truth that uh, has uh, been passed down to us by our forebears. So uh, the template that I would like to use uh, I I identifies four main types of law. Now, I didn't hear the previous lectures today, but uh, just from what I was told very briefly, I understand that uh, this may have uh, come up uh, earlier. Uh, but the, the four types of law, so this template that I would like to follow, uh, is eternal law, natural law, divine law, which is basically a way of saying biblical law, uh, I, I will use that title from now on, and human law. So eternal law, natural law, biblical law, and human law. So let me uh, begin. Eternal law. Uh, what is eternal law? It is God's own perfect reason and wisdom by which he rules the world. Or you might think of it as God's own righteousness and holiness. Uh, he is a perfectly morally good God, and he rules this world, he governs this world uh, through his perfect understanding, through his perfect wisdom. Now, Reformed theologians uh, we're somewhat divided as to whether we should call eternal law law, uh, but they all agreed that this idea is uh, very important, that God is a perfectly righteous and wise God, and he governs the world in accord with that righteousness and his wisdom. And an important aspect of this is that all, all law that God reveals to us in this world, reflects that eternal law. 
So if you just think about a, a couple of things that illustrate this uh, quite nicely and simply, I think, uh, think about the image and likeness of God. So in Scripture, uh, when the Bible speaks about the image and likeness of God, it, uh, the image always has this, or almost always has a moral component. To bear the image of God is to be called to, to be a certain sort of creature, to act in a certain sort of way. So you think about Genesis 1.26. God made man in his, uh, his image and likeness and called him to rule. Genesis 9.6. He who sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his image. You see that this, moral, this moral dimension to the image. And then in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, when Paul speaks about the renewal of the image, it's in the context of these moral exhortations uh, that we are being renewed in knowledge and righteousness and holiness. So to be the image bearer of God means we are called to be a righteous and a holy people. God conducts, governs this world. He governs us according to his eternal law, and he regulates us with a law that reflects that eternal law. Or you might just think very simply that command in Leviticus, uh, and again in 1 Peter, be holy as I am holy. Uh, our holiness is to reflect God's holiness. His law that he reveals to us reflects uh, his own eternal law. Now, um, one, uh, one last thing, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on eternal law, but one last thing on this, which is important. Uh, we don't have direct access to the eternal law. Uh, God is an infinite being. His wisdom, his understanding is infinite. We are finite. Uh, our finite minds cannot comprehend the infinite mind of God. And so, for God to make his own righteousness and wisdom uh, known to us, uh, he must do so in an accommodated way. He must stoop to our level and speak to us in ways that we can understand. And the way that he does that uh, is through covenant. For those of you familiar with the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, 1, uh, speaks uh, about how God voluntarily condescends uh, to us and makes himself known and relates to us uh, by way of covenant. Uh, so that is an indication to us that we should be uh, attentive to the covenant, covenantal context uh, in which God uh, reveals uh, his law to us. Uh, his law always reflects the eternal law, but will do so in a way that reflects the particular covenant relationships that he enters uh, in with us. So that is what I will say about the uh, eternal law. I'd like to move already now to the second um, category, uh, that of natural law. I, I haven't been hoarse, but I, almost, I feel like I'm a little hoarse. Uh, I, I wasn't at a ball game yelling or anything, but uh, I'm going to take a... So, <clears throat> natural law. What is the natural law? The natural law... Uh, I would define it as the revelation of God's basic moral law in the created order itself. So you might think of it this way, that God has made human beings with a particular nature. Uh, it means something to be a human being. We have a particular nature, and we have a particular purpose. Uh, God has made us for certain things. And not only has God made us with a particular nature and purpose, uh, but he has made this world in which we live with a certain nature. Uh, this world uh, uh, has a certain uh, purpose and orderliness that God has given it. And so you might think of it this way then. Given the kind of creatures we are, and given the nature of the world in which God has placed us, there are certain ways that it is fitting and unfitting for us to live within it, within this world, towards each other, and towards God. So it is God's, I would just emphasize this, it is God's uh, revelation. The natural law is the revelation of God's basic moral law in the created order. And we know this law 
through the natural capacities that God has given to us. As God has given us minds, uh, as he's given us hearts, as he's given us eyes and ears, as we live in this world, as we experience uh, the way this world works, uh, we come to know the natural law. In fact, we are confronted with this natural law at every moment of our lives. God impresses uh, upon us our obligations to him uh, by nature. So uh, just a, a, a few uh, words about this from Scripture. Uh, we might think, first of all, I think it's helpful to think, first of all, about the more general category of natural revelation. So God reveals himself in this created order. You might think of Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Or in Romans 1, Paul says that, uh, that all people uh, know him, not just might possibly know him, but know him through the things that have been made. So we know God through the things that have been made, and yet there are other things we know, uh, other truth that we know in this world. You might say that we, uh, we know truths about mathematics, we know truths about chemistry, we know truths about physics uh, in the world, from the world that God has made. And we also know one aspect of this natural revelation is our moral responsibilities as human creatures. So it's interesting in Romans 1, that uh, Paul, immediately after speaking about how we all know him in the things that have been made, he speaks about our, human, our responsibility. Uh, it doesn't just confront us as a piece of information, but it obligates us. Uh, and so um, Paul says that, uh, that all are accountable, uh, that no one is without excuse before God. Even if you've never heard a word of Scripture, uh, you are accountable before God because of this natural revelation. Paul goes on in Romans 1 to speak well, about a lot of things. He speaks certainly prominently about uh, sexual morality, and he speaks about how those who violate the natural sexual order uh, are acting against nature. At the end of Romans 1, after li listing a whole bunch of sins, he concludes in verse 32 by saying uh, that... Even though they know that these things, that those who do these things deserve death, they continue uh, to do them and to approve of those uh, who do them. And then in Romans 2, uh, Paul expands that further and speaks about how the things of the law, uh, the works of the law are written on the hearts, even of Gentiles uh, who don't have the law of Moses. I think it's also really helpful to think about the book of Proverbs here. Uh, this, is a, this is a rich resource for thinking about natural law. Um, so much of Proverbs, uh, uh, how, do you gain, how do you gain wisdom in the book of Proverbs? Well, a, a primary way is by living in this world, the experience of being in this world, observing, reflecting, concluding, seeing how the world works, seeing what sorts of things uh, bring peace and prosperity, uh, and what things bring disorder and, uh, and trouble uh, in this world. Uh, so it's very difficult to understand Proverbs. Uh, I, I don't know how I would understand Proverbs apart from the idea of the natural law. Now, let me say next, uh, just a word about the context of natural law. Now, in, in general, we can think about the context of natural law as the created order, as I've been speaking about. But of course, the natural order has not been static through all of history. So God originally made this created order perfect, uh, without evil uh, in it. And uh, surely, uh, there was the natural law uh, made known in the original created order. I mean, if if the fallen world reveals God's law, how much more uh, the originally uh, uncorrupted world. But after the fall, uh, God continues to make himself and his law known. And at least since the great flood, God upholds this world, upholds this natural order through the covenant with Noah recorded at the end of Genesis 8 into Genesis 9. 
So there, after the great flood, uh, as God reestablishes the order that had been uh, broken uh, in the flood, God makes a covenant, a universal covenant with the whole world, uh, and he uh, reestablishes uh, the, or the, the, the natural order and uh, the human and animal order uh, as well. Now, I would like to suggest, remember I said earlier that we don't have direct access to the eternal law. So if God is going to make his law known to us, that law has to be accommodated to our finite created nature, and God does that by way of covenant. And so at least since the, nature, uh, since the great flood, God, I would propose, makes known the natural law to us through the Noahic covenant. And it's, a pr it's pretty simple logic. I don't think this should be controversial, that if it's by the, nat by the Noahic covenant that God upholds the natural order, and the natural order makes known the natural law, then the natural law comes to us uh, by way of this Noahic covenant. This is the covenantal way that God mediates his law to the entire uh, world. So, let me, uh, let me conclude my remarks about the natural law by suggesting six things. I know it's kind of, you hear, let, let, let me conclude with six things. That sounds like a lot, but this is my last main point about natural law. So, uh, six brief things. Uh, that natural law accomplishes. Or you might think of it this way. What is natural law good for? Uh, why is it important for us as Christians to affirm this? <clears throat> well, first, natural law helps to... Uh, it communicates and helps us to understand the objective meaningfulness and purposefulness of the natural order. The objective meaningfulness and purposefulness of the natural order. There are obviously a lot of ways we can describe our current cultural situation and the moral upheavals uh, around us, uh, but one way to do so is that it is um, a, a giant denial that there is uh, a thing called nature, uh, that nature has meaning that nature has a purpose that is objective to it. Uh, in our postmodern world, the idea is basically that we, we determine and impose meaning and purpose uh, on this world, and whatever meaning or purpose there is, is that which we ourselves as individuals or our identity group decide we are going to give to it. Uh, well, Affirming the natural law is one of the great ways uh, to affirm that that is, that is terribly untrue. That this world has objective meaning and purpose that God has given to it, and it's knowable. And that all people are responsible for uh, the way that they respond uh, to it. So that's, that's one thing. The second uh, is that natural law is important very important for our Christian theology and ethics because it explains why every human being is accountable before the divine judgment. All right, there are many people in this world who have never heard a word of Scripture. Uh, and on what basis uh, can God justly uh, hold them responsible uh, for their sin? And the answer, this is, uh, this is clearly the answer of Romans 1, which I mentioned uh, a moment ago. Uh, it is because all people know God and his law through the things that have been made that no one can claim excuse before God. This is fundamental for explaining why all are accountable before the divine judgment. And if you want another text, uh, I, I, I love the opening of, of Amos is great on this point. You might remember that uh, in Amos 1 and then into the beginning of Amos 2, uh, God through the prophet uh, condemns, uh, briefly, but condemns uh, six Gentile nations, six uh, of Israel's neighbors, and uh, condemns each of them for their sins. It's interesting that after that, God condemns Israel and Judah, and when he gets there, he says, you have violated my law. That's the, that, that, he gives that reason, referring, obviously, to the Mosaic law. He doesn't mention, uh, he doesn't 
accuse these Gentile nations of violating the Mosaic law. They, they never heard the Mosaic law, but he holds them responsible for their sins. Uh, and th th these were great moral outrages, uh, including things like slave trading, uh, breaking treaties, ripping open, ripping open pregnant women. Uh, they were accountable for that, even though they had not stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, here's a third, a third thing that natural law accomplishes or that natural law is good for. Uh, it restrains sin uh, in human society. And this is what we often call in Reformed theology that has to do with the second use of the law. Uh, even where the law, even where people are not regenerated, there are still constraints that God has placed in this world to keep this world uh, from breaking into utter chaos and disorder. And I'd like to point, uh, as an example here briefly, to the story in Genesis 20, where uh, Abraham confronts uh, King Abimelech of Gerar. And you remember, uh, Abraham passes off his wife as his sister, and Abimelech uh, takes her into his harem. And uh, God lets Abimelech know that this is someone else's wife, he doesn't tell Abimelech that this is wrong, that it's wrong to have someone else's wife. It's interesting. He doesn't have to. Abimelech just knows that. And he goes to Abraham and he says, you have done things that ought not to be done. Here is a Gentile pagan condemning the great man of faith for doing things that ought not to be. There are certain things that no matter what, where you're from, what people you're from, what country you're from, certain things that are just not to be done. And one of those is giving up your wife into someone else's house. And Abimelech uh, knew that. Here is evidence of the natural law uh, constraining a sin. A four, okay, fourth. Uh, natural law is important because it serves as a moral foundation for human law and government. And I will say more about that when we get to the fourth uh, category, uh, that of uh, human law. So let me just move on uh, briefly to uh, the fifth and sixth uh, things that natural law does or reasons why natural law is important. Uh, the fifth is it's foundational for the gospel message. And I think the very simple proof of this, again, is in the book of Romans. Uh, between the middle of Romans, Romans 1, 18 through Romans 3, 20, Paul lays the foundation for his gospel message that he'll begin in earnest, expounding in 3.21. And as he tells us in uh, Romans 3.9, uh, the, the point of this first big section of Romans is to show that all alike, Jew and Gentile, are under sin. And one of the ways he does that is by talking about this natural law. God holding all people responsible, not simply by the Mosaic law, which is true, uh, but also by the natural law. So you might ask, why is the gospel relevant for Gentiles and not just for Jews? Uh, why does the gospel make sense? Why does it meet the need of Gentiles and not just uh, of Jews? Because Jews and Gentiles alike uh, are under God's law, are under his condemnation, and need, uh, a, need a savior. And the natural law uh, shows that that is true for Gentiles as well as Jews. So six, and finally then, under natural law, natural law is part of the standard for us as believers. We continue to live in this world. Uh, we continue uh, to engage in a variety of, of activities and institutions in this world, and uh, we need to be conducting ourselves according uh, to this natural law. So I won't say uh, uh, more uh, about that, uh, but that is... Uh, Certainly, I think, obviously, the case. So with that, let me move on to the third of these four categories of law. Uh, and I will speak about this third category at the greatest length. So uh, in older theological language, both uh, in medieval theology and in early Reformed theology, uh, they use the terminology of divine law here. I prefer the term biblical law just, just to make clear. I mean, eternal law and natural law is also God's law. So uh, I think it's more helpful to think of this as biblical law. And that's what they were talking about, um, the medieval and reformed uh, theologians. Now, obviously, Scripture is filled 
with divine commandments. And we could, I think we could say that all of these commandments are God's law in some sense. Uh, but here we're thinking especially about bodies of law. Uh, not, not just a command here or there, but bodies of law. And there are really two main bodies of law in the scriptures. Uh, the first, uh, quite obviously, is the law that gave to I God gave to Israel at Mount Sinai through Moses. Uh, what I'll call the Mosaic law, or what many older theologians call the old law. And the second body of law, maybe not quite as obvious, uh, but I would say the second body of law uh, are the ethical exhortations given in the New Testament. Uh, God uh, has filled the New Testament uh, with his law coming to us as the new covenant uh, people. We find this throughout the New Testament, but there are some places in the New Testament where you find some, uh, some special, uh, wonderful summaries of this. And uh, the two that stand out, not the only ones, but two that stand out would be Matthew 5 through 7, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I would also point to Romans 12 through 15, uh, Paul's longest extended exposition of uh, God's will uh, for, uh, for us believers. Um, I'm going to refer to that, uh, this law, as the law of Christ. And I'm picking that language up from Galatians uh, 6, for, uh, verse 2. Paul also uses a variation of that language in 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, in Galatians 6, 2, uh, as Paul refers to the law of Christ, it's, it's certainly in a context in which Paul is focused on this law as it comes to us as New Covenant uh, believers. So let me just proceed by making some comments about each of these two bodies of law as we think about uh, biblical law as a whole. The Mosaic Law, first. Now, uh, as, I, uh, as I have said, uh, it's important to think about uh, the revelation of God's law in covenantal context, since, again, we don't have direct access to God's eternal law. Well, the Mosaic Law uh, very clearly comes in covenantal context. Uh, in Exodus 19, uh, right before uh, the, 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 first, uh, the, the, the first text that begins to relate to the Mosaic Law, uh, God refers to the covenant that he's entering as he has now brought Israel to Mount Sinai. Uh, in Exodus 24, uh, we read about this, uh, this establishment uh, of the covenant, this kind of formal ratification of the covenant. Uh, of course, in Deuteronomy, uh, many places in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5, 9, uh, 29, we hear about this renewal of the covenant. So this covenant comes in a covenantal context, the, what we might call the Mosaic covenant, uh, the, the Sinaitic covenant. Um, we might just call it the Old Covenant, uh, which is the language of uh, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. So what can we say about this Mosaic law in covenantal context? It is a righteous reflection of God's holiness and his wisdom specified for Israel under the Mosaic Covenant. So one, uh, we want to uh, reflect on that now for a few minutes. How does it reflect God's holiness and righteousness in a way geared for Israel under the Old Covenant. I would like to suggest two distinctive features of uh, this law. It's not that there aren't uh, other things that we could focus on, but I think these are two prominent things that are distinctive about this law as it came to Israel through the Mosaic Covenant. Uh, one is this, uh, the first... Uh, is that this law uh, is given to a people under age. By that I mean a people who had not yet received the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah was yet to come. Uh, they were a people uh, who uh, were still living in the shadows of redemptive history. And so to understand the Mosaic law in this particular context... Uh, it's important to recognize all what we uh, will often call the types and the shadows of Christ and his redemption that, uh, that God instilled in this law. He gave them 
He gave them uh, a temple. Uh, he gave them a priesthood. He gave them sacrifices. Uh, he gave them so many things that uh, were not permanent, but looked forward uh, to Christ and the accomplishment of salvation and that everlasting uh, heavenly sanctuary uh, that awaits uh, the people of God. And so, so many parts of the Mosaic Law regulate uh, Israel's worship and their participation in these types and shadows. Another distinctive feature of the Mosaic Law in the context of this covenant was that uh, it established Israel as a holy nation. Uh, and I mean by that a holy nation uh, in a geopolitical sense. I guess you, know, you could use, na I don't mean like University of Florida football team referring to Gator Nation. Uh, you can use nation in different ways, but this is nation in a geopolitical sense. So God gave to Israel as part of this covenant, he gave them not simply uh, a spiritual government, but also a temporal government. Uh, not only a spiritual authority, but temporal uh, authority. Uh, he committed uh, to Israel um, uh, the sword, the sword of justice uh, to enforce as part of their covenantal life. Uh, I think a very good way to refer to this is that uh, it was a theocracy. The Mosaic Law, in the context of this covenant, established Israel as a theocracy, a holy nation geopolitically, distinct from other geopolitical nations. An important, really important part of this is that this covenant and this law gave Israel its own land. There was a holy land that Israel uh, was to live in. And, of course, in that land, there, was, there, were some, there were some places in that land and some activities in that land that were more holy than others. But, certainly, that land as a whole was holy, and it needed to be kept holy. Interesting, some of the things that uh, the Mosaic Law says about the land. Leviticus 25 says it was God's own land. Leviticus 18 says it was not to be defiled. Numbers 35, remarkably, says God himself dwelled there. This was God's special dwelling place uh, on earth. And so this helps to explain many of the other uh, prominent and striking features of this law. So for example... The Mosaic Law required Israel to expunge the foreign nations, all the foreign na nations that were living within the bounds of this land before Israel arrived under Joshua. Israel did a very poor job at that. Uh, but because this was a holy land, there were not to be any uh, Gentile uh, idolatrous nations to be living in that land. And also we find in the Mosaic Law that Israel was to expunge from its midst all of its own idolaters. So any Israelites who worshipped false gods, who practiced uh, uh, sorcery, divination, uh, all sorts of false worship, they too uh, were, to be, they were to be dealt with. And in almost every case, they were to be dealt with uh, in extreme measure uh, through capital punishment. Uh, so much of Israel's law then was designed to protect uh, and uh, to protect the purity of the land and to remedy uh, things that brought defilement uh, to that land. Uh, one one uh, more interesting thing about the law of Moses and the land is that you can find some examples in which the law commanded something different for Israel when they were outside of the land, uh, as opposed to when they were in the land. So I, I think a very uh, interesting example is uh, Deuteronomy 20, uh, when it gives uh, regulations about warfare. And it says, we, if you're fighting against a nation outside the land, far away, you should deal with it in this way. You, you can offer terms of peace. But when you're fighting against a nation within your land, you can't do that. You can't offer peace. Uh, you, you have to destroy them. Uh, it's also interesting, when, um, when Israel went into exile in Babylon, uh, in Jeremiah 29, 
uh, God, uh, through Jeremiah, sent a letter to the exiles and said, seek the shalom, seek the peace of the city in which you're living. So basically, seek the peace of the Babylonians when Israel returned. And that was something they were not supposed to do when they were in the land. And when they came back to the land in Ezra 9, God says again, don't seek the peace of your Gentile neighbors. So the, the land was a very, very important part of that law uh, to keep that land uh, holy. So those are some thoughts on the Mosaic law. What about the law of Christ? So this is this other, the second uh, body of law that we find in, uh, in Scripture. And again, the, by the law of Christ, I simply mean uh, the law as it comes to us under the new covenant revealed in the New Testament. I would, I would define the law of Christ in a way similar to the way I just defined the Mosaic law, or d described it briefly. The law of Christ also is a righteous reflection of God's holiness and wisdom, that is, of the eternal law. It's a righteous reflection of God's holiness and wisdom appropriate for the church under the new covenant. Now, it makes sense that where there is a new covenant that there would be a new law, or at least a revised law, that is appropriate for God's people in this new and this better situation. Of course, Hebrews calls uh, the new covenant a better covenant. And it's just, if, if, if we just uh, think about this for a moment, uh, Galatians 3. Galatians 3 provides this really nice summary of redemptive history, from Abraham to Moses to Christ. And one of the things that Galatians 3 makes clear is that from the very, that God put the Mosaic law into place for a time. Now, it was always God's intention for it to be temporary. Uh, it was put into place until the Messiah uh, would come. It locked up God's old covenant people in sin until the Messiah uh, would arrive. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, at the end of Hebrews 8, uh, the author of Hebrews uh, says that now that the new covenant has arrived, and he, he quotes Jeremiah 31, the new covenant prophecy at length. Now that the new covenant has arrived, he says, the old has grown obsolete, and it is now fading away. So there's a new covenant uh, in which we rejoice, and it's appropriate that God's law reflects the realities of this new covenant. What does the law of Christ reflect then? It reflects the fact that Christ has come and finished his work. That our Savior is now exalted in heaven. Uh, that he reigns already in the new creation. And already uh, we are citizens uh, of that uh, uh, everlasting, unshakable kingdom. The way that I've come to like to describe this, the, the law of Christ is that it is God's law refracted through the work of Christ. So that this <clears throat> idea of refraction, that you know, if light goes through a prism, it's refracted. Um, it's the same light that goes in one side and comes out the other, but on the other side, it's, it looks different and it's more beautiful. I, I think this is a great way to think about God's law. I mean, there's, in a sense, there's one God's law. It's the same law of God, uh, and yet as it's refracted through that prism of Christ's death and exaltation, the law now comes to us and it looks even more beautiful uh, than it did uh, before as it reflects that great reality. Really, uh, in terms of what's on my own heart, uh, this, this is what I most want to talk about tonight, the, this law of Christ. It is so beautiful. And since this is, this is where the New Testament focuses, this is the law of the New Testament, it makes sense that this is where uh, we would find a special delight uh, to think about uh, God's law uh, this evening. So let me uh, just uh, reflect on uh, a couple of distinctive things about the, uh, the law of Christ. And I want to look at these two distinctive things uh, in a way that compares it to the Mosaic law. So I want to use the same two categories that I used for the Mosaic law. So the first thing I looked at under the Mosaic law uh, was the fact that uh, Israel, in that covenant, uh, existed under types and shadows. And so God, in so many ways, regulated their life and worship uh, to accommodate that, that shadowy uh, uh, existence that they, uh, that they had. 
Well, now in these last days, God's law comes to us uh, no longer reflecting types and shadows, but reflecting the reality. And so as the law of Christ regulates our worship, as it regulates our prayers, as it regulates the life of the body of Christ, the church, it reflects the fact that we no longer operate uh, with types and shadows. Uh, we no longer offer bloody sacrifices, uh, but uh, we rest uh, in the one final sacrifice of Christ. We no longer have to go to one temple in one place on this earth. We, as Paul puts it in 1 Timothy 2, uh, men everywhere lift up holy hands in prayer. Anywhere we are, any place, uh, we can pray to the Lord and uh, seek his face and have access to that heavenly temple, as Hebrews emphasizes. It's not the high priest once a year who gets to go into an earthly sanctuary. Every single Christian, every Lord's Day, in fact, every time you pray, we have this mysterious spiritual communion uh, with that heavenly assembly that Hebrews 12 speaks uh, about. When we hear the word preached or read the word, we no longer hear only the Old Testament read and preached, but we hear the entirety of the scriptures. In so many ways, the law of Christ regulates a new and better covenant uh, given our, our situation. Uh, the, uh, secondly, then, uh, I reflected when I was talking about the Mosaic Law a moment ago, I reflected on the fact that uh, the Mosaic Law established Israel as a geopolitical nation, a holy nation, a theocracy in a particular land. And this too is quite different uh, when we come to the New Testament and consider the law of Christ. Uh, the New Testament gives us as Christians no holy land here on earth. We have a holy land, but the holy land is that heavenly land, that new creation that we are longing for, that will be revealed fully on the last day. As we are here in this world, uh, we, we have no holy land. Uh, God wants Christians to be everywhere. Wherever there are people, uh, God wants the gospel to go and wants the church established. Wherever there is a language spoken, God wants people to worship him in that language. Wherever ever there is a people group, God wants that people group. Wants, he, wants, he wants his own people from that people group. And so there is no holy land, but we live dispersed uh, as exiles and sojourners uh, throughout uh, this world. For this reason, at least related to this reason, the law of Christ does not give to the new covenant people, the church, uh, temporal authority. He does not give us, any, but what I mean is political authority. He does not give the church the sword. Uh, our, the new covenant people do not have authority to enforce justice uh, through uh, coercion. It's interesting that really the New Testament says very little about political authority. Uh, there are uh, a few texts that do tell us that political authority is still legitimate, uh, that God has ordained it, uh, that our civil magistrates ought to do what is just, punishing evildoers, and that we should be properly submissive uh, to them. Uh, but the New Testament has relatively little interest in uh, what government looks like and uh, how it should be regulated. What does the law of Christ focus on if it's not focused on, uh, uh, on uh, political, temporal government? Well, the law of Christ primarily focuses on the body of believers. Uh, if you, if, when we read the ex ethical exhortations of the New Testament, uh, the, the vast majority of them uh, talk about how we as, as individual Christians live and how we relate to each other as Christians, how we deal with one another. How many times does that phrase, one another, uh, appear in the scriptures? The law of Christ is primarily focused on the covenant community. That makes sense, since it's the law of the new covenant. And the new covenant community is the church of Jesus Christ. And yet it's also true that the law of Christ revealed in the New Testament reverberates beyond the church, and it does have important things to say about how we relate uh, also to our non-Christian neighbors. So let me say just a couple of things briefly about each of those. What does the law of Christ tell us about 
our mutual life, our life as the body of believers. I think any fair reading of the New Testament has to conclude that it focuses on love, service, unity, mutual edification, and humility. These are the things that the law of Christ focuses on. It reflects the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has paid the debt. He has made us a righteous community in God's sight. He has established peace between Jew and Gentile, between Greek and barbarian. And uh, we, he has given us already citizenship in his, in his kingdom, his everlasting kingdom. And we should reflect that in the way we conduct ourselves as the people of God. So you might think about some examples. I would love to talk about this more, but I'll have to be relatively brief. Think about, I mentioned Romans 12 through 15. You think about Romans 14 and 15, where Paul speaks, how he emphasizes that we, the church, are not to judge each other on indifferent things. What are we to do? We should welcome each other. Why? Because Christ has welcomed us. He says that we should not please ourselves. Why? Because Christ did not please himself. That is what is to characterize us under the law of Christ. Or Galatians 6, verse 2, which I've mentioned, uh, where Paul says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Is anything, is there any better summary of the Christian life than that, that we bear one another's burdens. And why do we do it? You don't have to be a genius to see it. Because Christ has borne our burdens. Christ has taken the load off of our shoulders, that heavy, heavy load. And so we can now take others' burdens upon our own shoulders. We stand with each other and help each other. Or you think of Ephesians 4 and 5, another great uh, comprehensive... Uh, Thorough summary of the law of Christ. What does Paul emphasize in Ephesians 4 and 5? How we speak. What could be more fitting in our own day about how we speak to each other? And what does he say? We, we speak the truth in love. We speak the truth to edify, to build up, not to tear down. Or Philippians 2. Philipp, the opening of Philippians 2, short text but Paul goes on to say, have this mind which was in Christ Jesus, who being God, didn't consider it a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, became a servant. What does he say in the beginning of Philippians 2? Don't look to your own interests, but to those of others. Or briefly, I might mention 1 John 3 and 4. We should love each other and lay down our lives for each other. Why? because Christ laid down his life for us. Or Matthew 18, church discipline. You notice church discipline in Matthew 18, it's not about doing justice. It's not about punishing. It's not about bringing the sword upon those who sin. What's it about? It's about restoration. It's about reconciliation. It's about forgiveness. Remember what the parable was right before that text? It's the parable of the good shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one wanders off and the good shepherd goes off to find that one sheep. That's our model uh, for church discipline. What about with respect to the outside world? How does this, how does this law of Christ reverberate out uh, to the world? Well, one thing is that uh, we are to love all of our neighbors, even our enemies, and I certainly would call your attention to the end of Matthew 5. Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy. I think it's too easy for us to try to, to, try to smooth that text over by saying, well, this is Jesus just refuting the rabbis at this point. But Jesus has his eye on the Mosaic law here. He's, he's, he, there's a comparison going on. The Israelites under Moses were not to hate all of their enemies for sure. But there was a place for hating their enemies. You might think of Psalm 139, Psalm of David. O oh Lord, do I not hate those who hate you? I consider them my enemies. 
There was a place for that. There was a place for holy war against the enemies of God. And Jesus says that is not going to be the way under the new covenant. There is no more holy war. We do not take up the sword against our Gentile neighbors. We love all of our enemies. And I might just point out that 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 text in Matthew 5 lays foundation for how Matthew ends. The end of Matthew 28 is the Great Commission. You can't evangelize people you've killed. We love our enemies so we can evangelize our enemies. This is how uh, we fight the Lord's battles uh, in this age. And to this end, just notice, note a few other things. In Romans 12, verse 18, we live at peace with all people as far as it lies with us. Galatians 6.10, we do good to all people. And of course, I should also mention this. As we think about our life facing outward, we remain holy. Paul warns about this at the end of 2 Corinthians 6, beginning of 2 Corinthians 7, 1 Peter 1, 1 Thessalonians 4, how important it is that as we live amidst Gentile pagans and don't take up the sword against them, uh, that we do not, are not uh, corrupted by their uh, defilement. So that brings me then to the last of these four categories, uh, and that is human law. Now, to, uh, to be clear, human law is not God's law per se. So eternal law, natural law, biblical law, that's all, those are all versions of God's law. Human law is, by definition, human but human law has traditionally had an important place in a Christian theology of law and for understandable uh, reason. Now, Christian theologians uh, almost unanimously uh, have taught that God provided a specially revealed civil law, political law, to only one nation on earth for a very particular uh, period of time. And that, of course, was uh, to Israel uh, under Moses. Uh, but the rest of the nations of this world, uh, through history, uh, including all nations today, uh, do not have a specially revealed civil law given to them. Uh, we, must, we must make our own laws. We must develop our own civil human laws. And Christian uh, theologians have uh, traditionally said that this, this human law, this civil law, can take different forms in different places. It doesn't, doesn't have to be identical in every place. It must always be grounded in God's natural moral law, but it can take different forms and have different details uh, in different places. So the, uh, the basic uh, idea that I would like to reflect on in the, uh, uh, for, for this final section is the idea of human law being properly grounded in uh, the natural law. Before I do that, let me just say a few remarks about uh, human law and the Mosaic law. Um, I don't know if this is like elephant in the room sort of thing, um, but it seems appropriate that I would say uh, a few things about this. Uh, as, as I see it, and uh, as I understand this, this is, the, uh, this is certainly the predominant uh, view through Christian history, uh, is that God gave the Mosaic law uh, to Old Covenant Israel. Uh, a covenantal law uh, obligates those who are members of that covenant. Uh, and uh, the laws of Moses uh, were meant to regulate the covenant relationship between God and Israel. And as we, of course, there are many civil laws uh, in the Mosaic law from which we can learn uh, a, a great deal about justice. Uh, but those Mosaic civil laws are thoroughly intertwined with the rest of the Mosaic law. And especially, we see that these, even these civil laws are very much geared toward protecting the holiness of the land, uh, to do justice in the land, to protect uh, the land's holiness and the people themselves. Today, no geopolitical nation uh, or its land is holy. The United States is not a holy nation uh, that is in a redemptive covenant with God. The state of California uh, is not. Uh, no other country uh, is. And so God did not give the Mosaic law, even the Mosaic civil laws, uh, as for the purpose of regulating uh, 
uh, geopolitical nations today. However, and this is a big, uh, a big however, the nations of the world, every nation of the world today is in covenant with God. They're in covenant with God through Noah, through the, the covenant with Noah after the flood. Think about that covenant. I want to come back to this covenant, which I mentioned briefly earlier. God established that covenant, end of Genesis 8, beginning of Genesis 9, after the great flood. God established this as a universal covenant. It was made with all human beings. In fact, with all living creatures, including all the animals as well. And it included even the natural order. Summer and winter, day and night, seed time and harvest. God made promises to the earth. All right, so this is a truly universal covenant made uh, with all people. And one of the things, and so I, I also should mention this, that the uh, Genesis 8.22 says that, God says that this covenant is in force for as long as the world endures. And that means it's still in force today. Right. It's in force until Christ returns. At that point, there's, there's no need for it any longer. But until then, this Noahic covenant is still in force today. And one of the things, it doesn't command many things, but one of the things it mentions is that we should do justice. He who sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. God gives the sword of justice to the human community, the whole human community, in this uh, Noahic covenant. So if the Noahic Covenant, furthermore, is the way that God reveals the natural law to us now, then we could also say that natural law is properly uh, the foundation uh, for human law. Civil law ought to reflect the natural law. So that raises a question, how exactly should it do that? And this is really the last big question I would like to, uh, to ask uh, before closing uh, this evening. So how is the natural law, how does it regulate human law, or how does human law, how should it reflect the natural law? Here's my basic answer. It should, the natural law, or okay, let me start over. This, civil law should reflect the natural law in a way that expresses the Noahic covenant's purposes for human political community. So we need to be attentive, what are the purposes of the Noahic Covenant? Why, has it, why is it in force? What is it meant to accomplish? What does it say about the human community in this world that uh, it, is, uh, it is obligating? Well, here is an, an important thing to say. The Noahic Covenant's purpose for human community, for human political community, is to preserve it not to sanctify it. The Noahic Covenant aims to preserve the human community, not to sanctify it. Right? Later biblical covenants will be very concerned about sanctifying the covenant people. The Noahic Covenant aims to preserve it and to preserve the human community, uh, the whole human community, all people, uh, without qualification by race, or ethnic background, or language, or religious profession. And that's important to note. Even without reference to religious profession, the Noahic Covenant aims to preserve the entire human community. And so it also then aims to protect and promote justice for all human beings. So it's interesting in that statement in Genesis 9-6, he who sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, you notice that it's whoever, whoever sheds the blood of man. It doesn't matter who you are. You exercise violence against another human being, justice ought to come upon you. And you notice the other end of it. Whoever sheds the blood of man, uh, by man shall his blood be shed. Whoever you are, if you're a victim, doesn't matter who you are, if you are the victim of human violence, you deserve to have justice. There ought to be retributive justice 
enforced by the entire uh, human community for the benefit of all people. For the purposes mentioned in the Noahic Covenant, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So God in the Noahic Covenant wills to preserve this world so that it might expand and fill uh, this earth. And the natural law ought to be enforced by the human community insofar as it protects human beings from the violence uh, which we do against each other. How does that... How does that work out in detail? Well, Scripture has not uh, told us. Uh, there is certainly lots of room for debate and for wisdom as we seek to put that into practice. So again, human law. Human law should aim to preserve rather than to sanctify our human political communities. And for that reason, I would, I would say we should not promote in our human law a new sort of theocratic arrangement. We should not promote a Christian America or some sort of new Christendom. Instead, I would suggest that human law properly protects things like the liberties that the First Amendment of the United States Constitution mentions. Freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of religion. I believe that there is a strong case to be made for that uh, from God's government of the world under the Noahic Covenant. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Drunen, for your lecture. We appreciate it. I think we do have a couple questions that came in online. Uh, one of them, I believe this was for you. Uh, what does it mean that God's laws are an expression of his goodness? Can you comment on that? Or? Sure. Yeah, I would say that the, uh, we, we believe that God has, God has attributes, uh, that one of the attributes of God is his goodness. Uh, he is, what we might say, he is morally perfect, infinitely uh, morally perfect. And... Uh, God, when, when God creates, he communicates uh, that goodness. Uh, his uh, creation order reflects uh, his own inherent goodness, uh, but uh, in a creaturely way, in a way that's suited for our finite nature, uh, our finite existence. Uh, and so as God binds us to himself, as he obligates us morally, it does that through giving his law, that law must reflect uh, his goodness. In other words, a good God does not command evil things. So that would be a, maybe a, putting it in that negative way perhaps, perhaps uh, communicates that point. Okay. Is there any questions in the room? Would anyone, does anyone have a question they'd like to ask Dr. Van Drunen? There's a mic. If you could walk up to the mic in the middle there. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for speaking this evening. Uh, I want to make sure I heard you correctly when you were discussing the book of Proverbs. Uh, did I hear you correctly that your understanding is that the wisdom seen in the book of Proverbs can be derived by unregenerate man observing natural law in nature and in human interactions? Uh, well, I would, I would have a more nuanced position than that. So. Uh, I, that, I, I didn't say that uh, exactly. What, what I did say was that um, the, the, the primary way that Proverbs communicates that wisdom is learned is through experience in this world, uh, through the observation and reflection on the things of this world and by being instructed by those who have more experience with this world than, uh, than we do. Uh, so th th that, that was all I was trying to say at that point. Now, uh, I would say that I, I, I do think it is true that uh, much of the wisdom of Proverbs uh, can be and is uh, understood by many uh, uh, unregenerate people. And I think we just, I mean, you can, you can look at a lot of you can look at other cultures, wisdom literature. You can look at Aristotle. I mean, you can find a lot of the ideas that are there. And you also have, um, 
a number of places in the Old Testament that acknowledge the wisdom of other peoples. And so like the wisdoms of the men of the East or the wisdom of the Edomites, you find that on, on um, a couple of occasions. Uh, now, like, Solomon was wiser than them, but it acknowledges that there was a certain wisdom uh, that they had. Now, of course, Proverbs, I, I'm not trying to make any blanket statement. I, I don't think, what, I'm not saying Proverbs is a natural law document in some kind of like simplistic way. Um, I, Proverbs obviously also highlights that the fear of the Lord, right, is foundational for our understanding, uh, our wisdom. Proverbs was written for the covenant people, so it was not written for the world as a whole. So I think with, with, with some of those nuances, I would, uh, I would answer your question. Yep. All right, thanks for the question. Uh, we'll go back to an online, we'll go back and forth here. Um, one question we received, actually two of them related to a new covenant law style position. Um, Dr. Van Drunen, can you distinguish your definition of the law of Christ from the NCT, the new covenant theology use, since they feel the law of Christ does away with all the Mosaic law, even the Ten Commandments, how would you harmonize these issues with the historic reformed view, which sees the threefold use of the Decalogue? Yes, uh, I, 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 understand, I would like you to understand everything I said. Uh, it, it was meant to be consistent with the historic uh, reformed view uh, of the law and the use of the Decalogue. So, um, you might even see it in that, that um, refraction uh, analogy that I used, right? There's, in a sense, there's a single law of God. It's not some, some different law of God. Uh, it is the same law of God that is uh, refracted. And so I see uh, great continuities uh, between um, the old law and the new law, or how, however uh, we want to put it, between the natural law, the Mosaic law, and uh, the law of uh, the new covenant. Um, we find, I mean, we find all of the, well, if we're, if we're thinking about the Decalogue, um, obviously there are parts of the Decalogue that are uniquely mosaic. Uh, we are called to rest on the seventh day. Um, people are called to obey their father and mother that they might live long in the land that the Lord their God has given to you. So we see that it's geared for, put in a way for Old, old Covenant Israel. Uh, but I affirm that all the Ten Commandments continue to be binding upon us. Um, I think... The, the fourth commandment is an interesting one with respect to the natural law. Most Reformed theologians didn't think that, that the Sabbath per se, at least the details of the Sabbath, were re, uh, revealed in the natural law. But certainly all the other commandments, uh, quite clearly, they're all repeated uh, in uh, the New Testament. So th that, that would certainly be um, a major difference uh, with what I'm saying with the, um, the New Covenant theology. I, I, I kind of regret that, at least in certain circles, they seem to have co-opted that language of the law of Christ. But I would just remind you that Paul used the law of Christ uh, first, so it's, it's, it, it's common property of the church. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentleman over here, who's, who's up? I got two questions, but hopefully one of them's pretty quick. Is that okay? <laughs> so, so you mentioned that the, the covenant with Noah was binding upon all of humanity. So my question is, does God's covenant with Adam continue to be in effect? And if so, uh, over whom does it preside? Sure, okay, uh, yeah, I would, yeah, the, 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 the covenant with Adam is still in effect, you might say, in broken form with all those who are not in Christ. So I would say that uh, every single person in this world is, is in covenant either with Adam or Christ. It, it is either condemned under the covenant of works or redeemed under the covenant of grace. Um, so that, that is a fundamental difference be, you know, in, in every single human being. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, say that we've got two Christians, there's some law that's in question we're talking about, some civil law that they disagree over. Say they both come from sort of this natural law perspective. Uh, they both think that the natural law is what should guide civil law. Uh, but they look at this law and they disagree about whether or not that law is unjust. One says the law is just, the other says that it's unjust. How do we resolve this disagreement? Well, I guess, yeah, in part I would say, I guess, welcome to this world we live in. Uh, we're, we're, yeah. Use, though? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, it, it's a little hard to say it in the abstract. I mean, I would say the... Uh, if, 
Okay, I would say maybe one question I would want to ask first is, is this a disagreement about the natural law itself or about its application in our human law? I, I, so I think, I, I think that might make a difference. So let's say it was a difference about the natural law. One person says natural law prohibits this, another person says no, this is not. So there, um, that would get into a very, that is not a, a, a quick question, because that would get into deeper questions about how we understand the natural law. Is there a theological yeah. answer to that question? Well, I, I think, is there a theological answer? Yeah, is, is there a yeah. way that, you know, is it something that we'd look at scripture to, to determine, or how would we decide? Well, I think right? that, I, I, I do think, I, I'm a very, very strong proponent of the idea that we Christians, uh, should interpret the natural law in light of what Scripture tells us about nature. Okay. And so, if that's part of the answer, or maybe all, maybe that's the primary answer you were looking for, I would yeah. certainly affirm that. I, I mean, I've, yeah. I've written a big, thick book on a, a biblical theology of natural law. I have another smaller book coming out next year on, on this. And so, yeah, I, I, I think we, I don't know why we wouldn't look yeah. at Scripture through the lens, or look at natural law through the lens of Scripture. All right, I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you. We'll go back online. Dr. Van Drunen, which Reformed doctors taught that the Noahic Covenant was made with the entire world? Um, I, as far as, I mean, I, I don't know any that didn't teach that. So, um, so I, I, my basic answer to that question is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think everyone has, as far as I know. Now, Maybe there's a deeper question here that was, was not asked explicitly. Uh, there is a debate within the Reformed community, they, the, it, through the history of Reformed thought, as to whether we should understand the Noahic Covenant, the, the post-flood Noahic Covenant, um, as a covenant of, say, common preserving grace, or as an administration of the covenant of grace in some way. So I don't know if that might be behind it. Um, I would take the position, as you might imagine, that it's a covenant of common preserving grace, since it makes, it makes absolutely no redemptive promises. Uh, and that was a view, uh, you can find that in some older Reformed theologians like uh, Herman Vitzius, uh, Wilhelmus Abrakel. Um, uh, that was Abraham Kuyper's view. If you, if you look at the very like, first hundred pages of his big work on common grace, that's his interpretation of the Noahic covenant. Uh, Herman Bovink, Gerhardus Voss. So it's, uh, that's not the unanimous reform view, but there's a lot of, a lot of luminaries who, um, who held that. Okay, thanks. Next question. Dr. Van Drunen, thank you so much for your lecture and your taking the time out of your day to help us. Um, my question for you is, I have a teacher who is quite hostile to the idea of Reformed theology having any sort of biblical merit, and who says that it, in fact, restricts God to, and kind of puts him in a box rather than um, glorifying him. How can I gently and lowly respond to this person that it's not only, that Reformed theology not only glorifies God, but also reflects him in his law? Yeah. Uh, let me just add, let me as a follow-up, when, when this, this, you said it, 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 it's a teacher of yours who, uh, when he said that it restricts God, did, can you just tell me what he means by that and make sure I understand? She essentially says that it takes God, strips him of his, in a way, his mercy and his kindness and his gentleness and kind of leaves us with the darkened view of him okay. that he's just like an all-powerful angry deity waiting to yeah. okay. crush us. Okay, okay, I think I understand better now, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, a couple of, just to, as, a, as a general comment, I think it's, it's really important uh, to, to understand that Reformed theologians have always, uh, obviously they've always taught the sovereignty of God over all things. But they have, I would say, equally emphasized the goodness of God. And so much so that when they are talking about God's sovereignty, um, in, in places where God's goodness, kindness might come into question, they take special effort to be sure to say that God is not the author of sin. 
I was just talking in, I, I teach uh, an anthropology course at, the, uh, at, at Westminster every fall, and I was just uh, talking yesterday about Westminster Confession 6, which is about sin, and um, the six, six, uh, section one talking about how God, uh, that the, the fall of Adam and Eve was within God's counsel and plan, and yet it, goes, it wants to say that this God permitted uh, it, wants to, it wants to make sure that God is not tainted with any stain. And so one thing that you might think about is, I think one of the beauties of Reformed theology, at least done well, is that it doesn't take one doctrine, one biblical doctrine, and use that to run roughshod over other doctrines. That it, it affirms the whole counsel of God. And that if we, either, if we either say that God is not sovereign, we ha for the sake of his goodness, we have to run roughshod over so many biblical texts. We dishonor God. We make God an impotent, I guess, uh, kind of you know, stronger than us, but ultimately an impotent God. How is he going to actually, how can we have confidence that a God who's not sovereign can actually bring good out of the disaster this world is. Maybe that's one way to do this. To, to, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know the person you're dealing with, but what confidence do we have that a God who's not sovereign can actually bring restoration to this, to this broken world? Um, w without, God's, without God's goodness and sovereignty, I would say the biblical witness uh, breaks down. The, the, those are a few thoughts. I'd... Thank you. Yep. All right, we have time. We have about three minutes, 8.40. We want to kind of close this portion and move to our panel discussion. Uh, so we'll take one last question from the line, the lineup. Thanks for coming, Dr. Van Drunen. Uh You said that um, natural law under the concept of the Noahic covenant serves to preserve human society, not sanctify it. And so my question is, can any human society be long preserved without holiness. And then you mentioned the recapitulation of the creation mandate, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Is it, is it implied then that the purpose of the Noahic covenant is to fill the world with unbelievers? If, if we're simply trying to preserve society so that they can be fruitful and multiply and fill, but not sanctify them, do you see the I think so. where we're going? I think okay. so, yeah. Um, Okay, so the, the, the first part of your question was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, please remind me of the first part of your question. Can any human society long be preserved without holiness? Yeah, thank you. Uh, th that is, I would say, uh, apart from God's common grace, there's no way we could conceive of that. Uh, and I, I, I would say, and I, I, I would not hide this for a moment, that I think that Human life, political community under the Noahic Covenant is fragile. Uh, it is, uh, gains are hard won and hard protected and easily lost. Uh, it's a sinful world. And so um, I, I, I don't think that it is at all easy, but we do have God's promises of common grace. Not just in the Noahic Covenant, we have other promises as well. And that gives us reason uh, not, to, not to give up, not to keep in whatever way we can, in whatever calling we have in society, uh, to promote what's good, to promote what's just. And we leave it in God's mysterious providence as to how he will use that and how he will uh, preserve this world. I think just a, a couple more uh, further reflections on that briefly. I'll try to be brief. Um, for one thing, I think it's remarkable to think, okay, I mean, on the whole, um, most people through most of history have not been believers. They've not been regenerate people. And yet it is remarkable how much we've accomplished as a human race uh, under the Noahic Covenant, unwittingly. I mean, I think we just hit 8 billion. I, I just saw this like in the paper like a day or two ago. Like we, we have hit 8 billion people. You think about the size of the human race in Genesis 9, that's, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and all the things that we have accomplished. And um, so it, it's not as if God's common grace is, is without effect. It's fragile. 
But it's not as if God hasn't proven that uh, through his common grace there is much good that is brought out in this world. And I would also say, I, this is, I, I say this with a little bit of a fear of sounding like a, a smart aleck, which I don't want to be, but uh, in terms of like, creating like a holy society, like, God's people tried once to be a holy theocratic people, and they failed miserably. So we're 0 for 1 on that. So it's not as if that has, um, that has a good track record uh, itself. So in terms of your second uh, question with regard to filling the earth, I mean, I, I, I don't think we would look at, I don't think we want to look at the Noah covenant in terms of believer, unbeliever. Like, does God want to fill the earth with believers or unbelievers? That's not the question that I see the Noah covenant answering. It's just, it's treating us not as believer or unbeliever, it's treating us as human, as image bearers of God. So I think we can say that the, that the Noahic covenant aims to fill the earth with human beings. And the new covenant, with its great commission, aims to make a multitude of those people God's holy people, members of his church, citizens of heaven. So that's how I would answer that. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Drunen. Thank you.